everything that you've got in the car, including your children, are going to go flying. Hey guys, it's Joel. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to the massive Defender 130. So massive, in fact, that I've had to put you guys, the tripod, in a different time zone just to get this whole car in shot. And this week I've been using the Defender 130 as my daily driver. And so I'm gonna go into depth on what it is like to live with in this video. We'll be finding out if that third row of seats is actually a proper row of seats, whether this engine can handle the immense weight of the car amongst many other things. But firstly, I'm actually extremely lucky to have this car because it is brand new. It has less than a thousand miles on the clock and that's because it has recently been acquired amongst many others by the Out who have kindly lent me this car. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you may have seen that I also had the L461 Range Rover Sport and L460 Range Rover from the Out last year, both of which were very fascinating cars in their own right. But this is one that I've been particularly keen to try as I've never had, well, any experience in any Defender, let alone some of the older stuff, which I'm not so happy to admit. The great thing about the Out as a rental service though is that all of the things that would normally be optional extras when you rent a vehicle ordinarily are included with this. Things like unlimited mileage, EU cover if you want to take the car into Europe, and also an additional driver, which is really, really handy if, like me, you have a wife that really likes cars. Now, I don't know if you can remember when this latest generation of Defender was launched at the end of the last decade. It sparked mass panic and mass controversy, mainly because of the questionable design. You've got to remember that the Defender goes way, way back and has an incredible following. It's almost become a religion at this point, but the design of the Defender basically was unchanged for many, many decades. And then this thing was released and it was a bit of a shock for most people. In fact, I will admit, when I first saw the spy shots of the launch car, I think it was in that green color, I thought it was hideous. I mean, it looks, to me, it still does a little bit. It looks, looks like a Lego set, because I think it's so boxy and everything's a right angle. There's not really many curves on here. But after a while, I've decided I genuinely love the way these things look. And although it's not normally my style, this particular car in black on black, I think it actually really, really works for this car. But quickly, let's address the quite literal elephant in the room. How big is this thing? Is it actually really big or am I just really short? Well, <laughs> it's a little bit of both. It is really big. It's over 5.3 meters long, 5.35 meters long to be precise, which I always think back to my BMW 7 series, which I used to own. It was a 2007 car, had the V12 engine. It was the long wheelbase, which meant it was extra long just for the executives that would sit in the back. And that was only a smidgen over five meters. So we have almost an extra foot on top of how long my old long wheelbase car was. So that puts it into a little bit of perspective. But not only that, it's wide, the Defender, with the wing mirrors out just over 2.1 meters. I mean, that's pretty serious. And then height-wise in its normal suspension configuration, it's just under two meters. You can lower it with this particular car, it has air suspension, so right now it's in access mode. That brings it down about 10 centimeters or so. So you can still get into most height restriction car parks. But anyway, I guess I'm right in assuming that if you're watching this video and you're after a 130, it's probably because you want those seats in the back. So without any further ado, let's jump in there now and see if they're actually proper seats. So let me quickly interrupt to say a big thank you to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it very frustrating these days that every time you wanna purchase something online, you wanna sign up to a new subscription, or you want to download an app, you always need to put in your details, your email address, your phone number, even your home address. And unfortunately, that data of yours can get into the wrong hands. Your data can be exploited, it can be sold, and it can even end up in the hands of criminals. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon these days for large-scale data leaks to happen, exposing millions and millions of customers. So if you want to keep your personal information and data protected, and you want your email inbox and your phone messages to be clear from unwanted spam and sales pitches, then you need to be using Incogni. See, what Incogni does is it reaches out to data brokers on your behalf, requests your personal data removal, and deals with any objections from their side. 
Also with the family and friends plan, you can add up to four members to your subscription, meaning that they benefit from exactly the same service as you do. So head to the link in the description in cogni.com forward slash it's Joel to receive 60% off your annual Incogni plan. Thank you so much for supporting the channel once again. Let's get back to the video. But first, actually, I've got to make the seats because they folded down as I've been favoring boot space over rear seats this week. So hatch opens nicely like so. And then we've got three toggles here, which we can easily reach from behind the car. One, two, and three. And there's our eight seats. So now if we jump around here, pull up this toggle, seat moves forward. Quite a tight space to get in the back. There you go, doing it very ungracefully. But once you are in the back, as you can see, it is very spacious. My dad and I, uh, as soon as this car got delivered, I always like to show my dad these cars when I get the opportunity so we can have a play around. And the first thing we did was jump in the back of this car and we were both very pleasantly surprised at how much room there is. I mean, I'm sat here very uh, arrogantly with my legs crossed, man spreading, but you really don't need to uh, because these, these really are truly proper seats. Seat belt up here for the middle passenger. You wouldn't really want to be the middle passenger if you had a long journey. The child that ends up in this seat is definitely the least favorite child. And then moving to the left, as you can see, it is truly a proper seat. There's lots of room back here. My knees are completely unrestricted. The row in front of me is actually all the way forward. So I think in an ideal world, that would be a little bit further back, but it would have to come back a good six inches for it to even touch my knees. You do sit slightly low, so you kind of angled a bit more upwards than you would normally be, but there's lots of headroom. We've actually got our own sunroof back here, which is manually adjustable. We've got our own lights. We've got our own handles. We've got a cup holder here a good little storage net, and if we want to, a USB-C charger. It's very, very impressive, I have to say. and certainly justifies getting the 130 if your main utility is carrying people, because when you are in this configuration with the eight seats, the boot space basically reduces to nothing. Let me quickly show you. So you might be able to see what I mean. I'll jump inside for a bit of reference. Um, yeah, if you are going to be buying this car primarily for the eight seats, maybe for children, transporting kids to school. This is what you're left with boot wise. In fact, I can barely sit in here. This is very, very tight. So your storage capacity back here basically reduces to zero. If you're just taking the kids to the school and they've got a couple of sports bags and some rucksacks back here, that's going to be fine. But for any longer road trips where you're planning on taking a full cabin of people, you might struggle. There's not so much storage back here when you do have those seats up. When you pop them down, as you can imagine, there's a great big boot back there. But yeah, just be aware that if you're using the full three rows of seats, your luggage capacity back here severely reduces. Right, so now we've got that stuff out of the way, we can do my favorite bit, which is what it's like from the driving seat. Just quickly, the second row of seats, I didn't sit in there because it's fairly standard, Good leg, knee room, head room as well. Got the panoramic roof, which you can see from back there. Some air conditioning controls, no heated or ventilated seats in this one. And they are adjustable forwards and back too. So you can adjust for leg room between the two rows. It's very, very nice back there indeed. But up the front for me, this is the best bit. There's a really distinguishable design language with the Defender, with the Range Rover and Range Rover Sport that I've had previously. There's almost sort of nothing to really differentiate between the two of them inside. They feel almost identical. There's no cues to let you know that you're in a sport or you're in the full-size car. Whereas in Defender, straight away, there's some big differences, but also some really lovely design quirks, such as all of these Torx bolts all the way around the car on the trim pedals, the big Defender lettering here. We've got grab handles everywhere. We've got a huge grab bar along the top. And of course, our ZF 8-speed shifter is mounted up here on the dash with all the climate controls as opposed to down here on the central console. We have some large cup holders down here, a really big storage cubby down here. Got a flask in there, which has been completely hidden. A little tray here, which is handy for your keys. And down below, another large tray with a USB-C and a USB-A charger and a 12 volt. This steering wheel, again, very distinguishable from the other models in the lineup. It's got this gorgeous material. I'm not sure what it is. It probably is quite a cheap material, but it feels 
really, really nice to hold. Really, really farm-like, really rugged. I'm gonna use that word rugged a lot in today's review. But at the same time, it's familiar. We've got identical switch gear to the later L405 generation Range Rovers and the newest ones, except here they're not piano black, they're matte black, and they're more plasticky in feel, which actually is better because they're easier to interact with. However, it's not all rugged and utilitarian here. We've got a fantastic Meridian sound system, a lovely panoramic sliding roof, obviously got this central infotainment system, some lovely leather stitching, and these lovely leather seats. Now, it's not as much of a premium leather as we have in Range Rover, Range Rover Sport, but these seats are still extremely comfortable nonetheless. Lots and lots and lots of adjustability, and this one being a slightly higher spec, this is a HSE, we've got heated and cooled seats as well, which is really, really lovely to have. The steering wheel is also heated, should you wish, and it's electronically adjustable everywhere you look there's places to store stuff a massive tray up here above the glove box which is also large a little tray here a big area where you could almost put your mobile phone here in front of you and a large storage cubby down there in the door bins big enough for a bottle like this i love the shape of the wing mirrors again very distinguishable you know that you're in a defender it harks back to the older models gives you a good view all the way to the back of the car, which in this particular one is quite a long way. And my favorite thing of all is that view out front. It's absolutely fantastic. I don't really know how else to describe it. The bonnet you see in front of you is very, very square. It reminds me actually of the old L322 Range Rover. You sit really, really high up and the windscreen is quite flat and angular and it just makes you feel like you're in a bit of a tank actually. Let's just pop the ignition on then and have a quick look at everything else before we get going for a drive. So if you've experienced any JLR product in the last five or six years, this is all gonna feel very familiar. In fact, the same display in front of us that we would have in the Range Rover or Range Rover Sport, which are much more expensive cars, by the way. In this menu, we can configure various things. We can have it set up how we like. I have it set up with a rev counter and speedo in the middle, my trip summary on the right, and my media selection on the left, but you can configure it in different ways. And on the right-hand side of the steering wheel, we've got our cruise control controls. We have adaptive cruise control in this car, but the best thing of all is that you can switch the adaptive cruise control off, because I find it's always a little bit intrusive, potentially when there's a lot of traffic. Um, it's good in stop-start traffic, but apart from that, I tend to prefer using conventional cruise control. We've also got the button where we can activate or deactivate lane assist on here too. Proper chunky stalks for our lights and for our wipers. As I mentioned, an electrically adjustable steering column, which is great. And on the right, you'll find buttons for all of the windows, the wing mirrors, and all the memory functions for the seat control too. Looking towards the middle of the car then, very familiar screen after spending lots of time with the newer Range Rovers. However, I'm really, really, really relieved to report that since I was last in a newer generation Range Rover, there's obviously been some software updates, some improvements, and this is now so, I mean, markedly better. It now responds to your inputs first time. There's no fighting with the screen. We still have our controls for our seats on the seat for our heated and cool seats in this control panel here. We don't have to go into the screen for essentials like that. The Apple CarPlay works extremely seamlessly. It's not always been that way. And we can access settings for the car very, very quickly, of which there are many in here. We can change, obviously, our audio settings, but we can also go into the car settings in terms of the air suspension, exactly what we want regarding our drive mode. We've got eco, comfort, grass, gravel, snow, all of the usual suspects. And there's some cool pages like this 4x4i one, which gives you some information like your elevation, your heading, and what exactly everything's doing in terms of differential and the wheels, which is really, really satisfying if you're a nerd like me. Other than that though, it's just a really, really nice place to sit. It's extremely comfortable, but then you look around and you have all of these visual cues that you're in something quite extreme, quite off-roady, quite farmy. So it makes it feel quite characterful, but I wonder then how that translates into how this thing drives. So my best suggestion now is we start the engine up, start this three liter diesel up and go for a drive. So here we are in the Land Rover Defender 130 then on the road. And I have to be totally honest with you, my initial impressions could not be any better. In fact, I don't remember the last time I felt this excited behind the wheel of a new car. You sit so high up on the road and it feels even higher than the L460 Range Rover as a comparison. And you have this magnificent view over the bonnet and the bonnet is really rugged in appearance. In fact, it reminds me of the L322 Range Rover, which if any of you watching own one or have driven one, 
you'll know that they are just one of those cars that get under your skin because they have such an incredible charm to them, despite all of their many flaws. And straight away from 30 seconds behind the wheel right now, this has that same sort of charm. It's, it's hard to explain really, but I'm very much enjoying this. The fact that this is such a square car in design from the bonnet, but all the way to the back means that despite its incredible size, I mean, this thing is a behemoth. There's no getting around that. But despite that, because of the very straight edged shape of this thing, it's not particularly difficult to place because essentially this thing has four right angled corners to it as opposed to some curvaceous bumpers and design, which makes it easy to know where you are on the road. And that is particularly of use because this is a massive car, right? I mean, it is huge. It's wide, it's high, and it's very, very long, particularly in this 130 example. But I have to say, the length is not really something I'm noticing. Now, I took one look at this 130 when it arrived on my driveway earlier on in the week, and I thought, that's ridiculous. I mean, you might as well have a Mercedes Sprinter. I mean, it honestly looks like a van, but the length is really not something you notice, or at least it's something you get used to very, very quickly. You have to take extra care in car parks and on tight corners because yeah, there is just a bit more of the car that's hanging behind you. But really the thing that takes the most getting used to is how high you sit and how wide the car is. And that doesn't change whether you have a 110 or even a 90. So if you're thinking of a 130, but you think that the 110 would be just a bit more sensible because it's not as long, uh, think again, because like I say, the thing that actually takes the most getting used to is the width and the height. And that's gonna be the same across all of the models. And then I just wanna talk about generally how pleasant this thing is. So last week, I handed back the keys to a gorgeous 2020 Range Rover SV Autobiography that I had for the best part of two weeks. I was using it as my daily driver. And that was the pinnacle of luxury when it comes to JLR. That was the extra, extra, extra options ticked Range Rover of the time, the five liter supercharged engine, reclining limo seats in the back. But despite having that for two weeks and being very used to how that drives, a lot of the stuff you see in here is familiar in terms of the display in front of me is almost identical. But being a defender, I didn't expect the ride quality to be oh, parallel with that SV Autobiography. This thing is super supple. We've got air suspension controls, we can change our height. We've also got the adaptive modes as well, so we're in the comfort program at the moment. We have double glazing all around, and this diesel engine is just mightily quiet. And so from where I'm sitting, really, if I close my eyes, despite the fact I don't have silly quilted leather and massage seats, if I close my eyes and you told me I was driving the L460 Range Rover, an L405 Range Rover, I wouldn't immediately tell you that you were wrong because it really does just drive that well. And from the Defender, which is supposed to be the rugged outlander of a car, I wasn't expecting that at all, but it's very, very welcome. But unlike those Range Rovers, the design of this Defender is so much more characterful. And so for me, it feels like an old JLR product and old JLR products tend to tug at your heartstrings, unlike the new ones. The gearbox is the excellent ZF8 speed, and well, the reason it's an excellent gearbox is because you basically don't even notice it's there, which is exactly what you want for a car like this. There is low range as an option, and if we want to, we can flick across to Sport, which is an automatic setting, and from which we can then shift manually if we want to. There's no paddles on this car, actually, which is interesting. And this engine, well, I've sung its praises before because actually my previous loans from the Out were both D300s. That was the first one was the L460 Range Rover, which was a D300. Then the L461 Range Rover Sport, which was also a D300. And both times, this engine has left me mightily impressed. Let me give you some reasons why then. So it's a diesel car, but it is ULES compliant. It's also a very quiet engine, as I mentioned. In fact, you can hear it when you start it up and jump in the car, but because the car is so well insulated, you basically don't notice it when you're driving. And also it's very powerful. Yes, it's only 300 PS on paper, which doesn't sound like an awful lot, but if I demonstrate for you now, 30 miles an hour up to 60, I'm just gonna kick down. It takes a couple of seconds to get going. And there we are at 60 miles an hour now. 
It genuinely, the first time I did that, felt, as I would describe it, quick. You can even go one up from this and get the D350, which is a slightly more powerful variant of this same motor. But regardless of the fact that this thing weighs near on 2.7 tonnes, can transport eight people, not that I've actually done that, and is still quite quick, you can return quite easily 40 miles per gallon, which if you think about it, if you had eight people in the car and you were getting even 35 miles per gallon, then the miles per seat is very low then. It's very, very impressive indeed. My average over the last 150 miles, which admittedly has been mostly through town and doing a few accelerations, is 32.7, which I just think is mightily impressive. Because of the size of this tank, you can quite easily expect 500 miles of range between fill-ups, which is definitely a lot more than any electric car that could carry this amount of people, of which there aren't actually any in the UK at the moment. The handling as well is so, so lovely. It's adjustable and configurable. We can actually, in this model, have our own drive mode, which is a new thing to the JLR lineup, and we can choose between light, medium, and heavier steering. I have it in the lightest of modes, and it is extremely light when maneuvering, which definitely helps with having such a big car as this. But it also doesn't do the weird stiffening up thing, which I've complained about in both the Range Rover and Range Rover Sport of the newest generation. They do this horrible thing where it feels like someone's put a, a tensioner or a spring in the top of the wheel here, and you're sort of fighting with it. So just changing lanes at 70 miles an hour on a motorway is like, a two-hand job because it gets so stiff. This doesn't seem to falter with the same issue. And as such, it's just a seriously, seriously pleasant thing to drive this. As I mentioned earlier, they seem to have done some good updates with the infotainment system. This one obviously has the slightly bigger screen, which is good. But the main thing for me is that it's all so much more responsive now, as it should have been to start with. Even the screen in front of me that I can adjust with my buttons here on the wheel, still not perfect, but it is a market improvement over the last time I was in a Range Rover, which was that L405 a couple of weeks back, but also the L461 Range Rover Sport, which I last had. It's so much improved from that. If you do try and carry any sort of speed around a roundabout, for example, like this, as you can hear, everything that you've got in the car, including your children, are going to go flying. The car rolls quite a lot. It reminds you of its size and its weight when you try and do that. So if you are after anything even slightly dynamic, maybe, think again with Defender. But if it was my money, when you consider that the Defender 110 starts at 60 grand, almost 50 grand less than the Range Rover, for me, it's a no brainer. You, you basically aren't losing anything by, by having this over that car. Maybe some fancy massage seats or something like that, or a leather headliner, but I'm pretty sure you can add that stuff onto a Defender anyway. And if you can't, you wouldn't really miss it. You've still got the panoramic roof. You've got the fantastic seating position, the great visibility out of all four corners. You benefit from the wonderful D300 engine and the air suspension. It's a very soft and supple ride. We also have all of the off-roading capabilities that you're ever gonna need should you wish to do that with your Defender. And then over the Range Rover, actually, it's got more space, especially in this 130. Obviously, we can take eight people, but it is a very capacious interior. It feels almost bigger than the Range Rover in here. One thing I would say the Range Rover and Range Rover Sport have over this is the tailgate opening upwards, because with this car already being so long and having to then open the boot or the tailgate, outwards you need like six meters to park in fact you just have to park front ways because if you reverse up to any sort of wall where you want your front wheels to be in the space or any sort of driving space you're not going to be able to open the boot without being within the lines if that makes sense so Range Rover and Range Rover Sport certainly benefit from that but then at the same time if you have got the space for it it is really satisfying opening and slamming that rear door so I'm sure I'm stating the obvious here, but I am mightily impressed with this Defender. I thought I was going to like it, but I didn't think I would enjoy it this much. And I think for me, a large part of that is because Jaguar Land Rover have clearly made some really big strides in the right direction since I was last in one of their newest generation cars. Whether it's the infotainment system, even some of their security upgrades since I last had one of the newer models, it's all just come together to now make these things much more viable and actually really, really enjoyable to drive. 
don't get me wrong, I absolutely loved my time with the latest Range Rover and the latest Range Rover Sport, but there were too many things in them which were annoying. And then when you consider that they are basically a hundred plus thousand pounds, you just think, how on earth could anyone justify that? Even now on the newest Range Rover, they've done away with even these air conditioning climate controls, whereas on Defender, they are still here. And then when you consider the price point of Defender 130, this one 80 grand plus, and even a 110 at 60 grand plus, these actually just seem like really good value. So thank you to the Out for lending me this car for the week. It's been really enjoyable. And don't forget, if you actually want to experience one of these for yourself, you want to see if all the stuff I'm talking about actually makes sense to you, which I'm sure it will, uh, you can go to the Out now. Link is in the description. You can book one of these cars for yourself or a 110 even or any other JLR product for that matter. I'd like to thank you all for watching the video. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll see you all very, very soon.